thinking like the, the waste of like yesteryear is actually quite interesting to find and it's well made and well produced. You're talking buckles and buttons and stuff. If you've ever walked alongside the River Thames at low tide, you've probably noticed a few people searching through rocks and picking up objects on the shores. You were probably a little curious about what they were doing, but didn't question it. Now if you had asked someone, they would have explained they were mudlarking. The phrase mudlarking carries a couple of definitions, including a term used in Sussex dialect for a fisherman from Rye, a late 18th century slang expression for a pig, and someone who scavenges in river mud for items of value. Today, we'll be talking about the latter. In the 18th and 19th century, mudlarks would comb through the muddy shores and riverbanks of London to earn a living. These mudlarkers ranged between the ages of 8 to 15, or the elderly members of society struggling to make ends meet. Searching through mud that was often full of waste, sewage, and sometimes even a corpse. It really was one of the worst jobs at the time. Today, the term carries a very different meaning, and while youngsters do still take part, it's more for fun and entertainment than for survival. In fact, there are even guided tours that take place along the Thames for sure. It's definitely an addiction because I've been doing it this long. YouTuber Simon Bourne has been mudlarking ever since he purchased a metal detector in 2011 and found a group of like-minded people. He's since logged his finds onto YouTube and upcycles his discoveries into art. And in 2013, he even managed to reunite a man with his late grandfather's dog tag from World War One. When I when I found the uh, the dog tag, I thought it was like a 10p, like an old style big 10p. But when I cleaned it in my hand, I could see that there was an engraving on it, and it's got the Royal Flying Corps emblem. Um, it's actually got um, his name, which is Nathan Posner, and her number. And then underneath the bottom of that, it's got the word Jew. So he wanted, if he was, you know, to be to be killed in action, then he would be given a Jewish funeral, I presume, or just, you know, just letting people know of his religion. So anyway, all the information on this wonderful little um, French franc, silver French franc. So I wrote to the local newspaper and asked if anybody knew of the uh, descendants. And uh, a couple of weeks later, a guy called John Silverman, yeah, Sil John Silverman, he actually came forward and he was the grandson of Nathan Posner. So I met up with, met up with, uh, met up with John and uh, gave him back his granddad's dog tag. To be a mudlark, you need a license from the Port of London Authority, and without it, the activity is actually illegal. On the PLA's website, they state, All the foreshore in the UK has an owner. Metal detecting, searching or digging is not a public right, and as such it needs the permission of the landowner. The PLA and the Crown Estate are the largest landowners of Thames Foreshore and jointly administer a permit which allows metal detecting, searching or digging. So anything mudlarkers discover on the Thames Foreshore also belongs to the PLA, and anything found of high monetary value or archaeological interest must be alerted to Portable Antique Scheme Finds Liaison Officer at the Museum of London. A permit scheme covers activities that include searching, metal detecting, digging, scraping and finally, mudlarking. Unfortunately, the PLA has suspended permits for now, following a surge in applications which saw an increase of 5,000 permits compared to 200 five years ago. As well as a concern that mudlarkers weren't reporting their finds or selling them for profit, disturbing the unique historical integrity of the Thames. However, you can still join a guided tour or just have a browse off the foreshore. Though a seemingly peaceful activity, mudlarking is not without its dangers. Yeah, we've got quite a lot of um, dead rats. So you've got to think that, you know, these rats probably carry some sort of diseases. So you, you'll find a, you know, a rat now and again. Participants are at risk of getting Wheels disease. This is a form of leptospirosis and can be contracted from the urine of infected rats. Left untreated, the disease can lead to kidney failure, liver failure or heart failure. Infection is usually transmitted through cuts in the skin or the eyes, mouth or nose. So the PLA encourages mudlarkers to wear gloves and suitable footwear. As a general rule, bring your phone, don't go alone or tell someone where you're going to be and always check the tide timings. Many artists have even used items they've discovered through mudlarking in their artwork and sculptures. Drawing on pieces of driftwood, um, drawing on got a lovely piece of copper the other day, like that square, it's like a lid of a, I'm not sure what it's from, but it's, it makes a perfect canvas for doing some artwork on that. Something else which I've done is um, 
well, when I find a bottle with barnacles on it, it can you can varnish the barnacles on so they don't drop off, and then I draw on it like a shipwreck scene, you know, with a octop octopus and like a ship and all this stuff using uh, like metallic pens. So yeah, there's there's lots of things you can do to to you know get some extra longevity out of the items and be crafty at the same time. In 1997, nearly 5 million pieces of Lego disappeared into the ocean after a shipping container fell off the cargo ship Tokyo Express. Among the pieces were 418,000 swimming flippers, 97,500 scuba tanks, 26,600 life preservers, 30,000 spear guns and 4,200 octopuses, as well as seagrass cutlasses and dragons. And even today, 26 years later, pieces of Lego can still be found on the Thames foreshore and beaches across the world.